Well, hello everyone. It's now, believe it or not, almost 17 years since Concorde retired back in 2003. But many in the world of aviation still dream about supersonic flight being a reality. And some would say that private aviation is the obvious market for this globe-shrinking technology. Over the years, manufacturers, including Gulfstream, have looked at plans for a supersonic business jet. But now one company called Arion appears to be getting closer. And my colleague, Kerry Lynch, who's with us today, recently tuned into a briefing that they had on how plans for the AS2 jet are progressing. So Kerry, what's the latest on the AS2? And is it right that we might just be a few years away from our first flight? That would be quite something, I think. Well, Charlie, they're certainly getting closer, and I guess it's your definition of what a few years means, mm -hmm. but they're now talking uh, first flight in 2025. And in an aircraft development standpoint, five years away really isn't all that long. Um, it was pushed out just a little bit because of the effects of COVID and social distancing and, you know, the complexities with it. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're looking for a preliminary design review stage in 2021. They think they do have a set configuration now. They recently announced that. Yeah. Towards the end of this year, they're building their new factory where the aircraft will be produced. And That's going to be in Florida, isn't it? I think. Yes, factory. in Melbourne, Florida. Exactly yeah. right. And their, their timeline for entry into service is now 2027. Hmm. Well, that isn't so far away in the great scheme of things. And um, as I understand it, Arion is, is suggesting that maybe, you know, their plans won't just be for this one-off aircraft, that this could actually eventually involve a, a family of supersonic jets. How much more do we know about that? Well, it, it's kind of interesting. Tom Weiss, the chairman of Arion, spoke at the AIAA Aviation Forum this month, and he gave a like a 30 year vision for Ariane. And it goes much further beyond just the AS2 and really even supersonic transport. But the first thing he did show was the AS3, which they have been whispering about for some time now. And it is ostensibly a commercial aircraft when they showed an overlay of the AS2 over the AS3 and, it, and the AS3 is just much, much larger, but they didn't give any details to it. But their plans go beyond and looked at, look at different propulsion sets. Right now it's traditionally, it uses, well, I'll say traditional mm -hmm. propulsion. So it, the engine is going to be unique in that they're looking at full, having it run on full sustainable fuel. But they're also looking beyond that to hybrid next, and then perhaps one day all electric. But long term, they'd like to even go much faster than supersonic into hypersonic. And Vice said that he thought that right now they could probably get close to solving the nut of Mach 4 to 4 5. And this is part of a big vision of getting anywhere from any major city to any major city in three hours time. Well, to get there, you're going to have to go hypersonic speeds. Um, but it, it's just they're looking at uh, a whole ecosystem from getting door to door using eVTOLs. So Arion is going to be, if their vision plays out, much more than just the producer of the AS2 supersonic business. That's yeah. fascinating. And I mean, just to touch on that, that uh, hypersonic capability, I mean, to put that in context, that's a massive leap forward. Even in the glory days of Concorde, I mean, it was doing London to New York in, I think, three and a half or so hours. And, and that totally wowed people at the time. But now they're talking about getting pretty much anywhere on the planet in, in about that time, which would be a huge leap forward. But uh, we'll have to be a bit more patient for that, I suppose. Yeah. Decades patient, actually. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we'll get back to the uh, the environmental point in a minute. But um, just to be clear on the AS2, the first model, I mean, roughly speaking, how would that compare in size to, you know, business jets are available today that we're familiar with? Is it, is it very different in size, but just a heck of a lot faster? Or is it uh, radically different? 
Well, the size actually is a very important point. They need to have it to be at the 120 million price point and go towards the market they want to. They have to have the cabin to support that. And as we all know, business jets are bigger and more luxurious than ever with multiple zones. So they are targeting around the size of, say, a Gulfstream G600 or a Bombardier Global 6500. So for a supersonic aircraft, it's going to be a large business jet. And they're looking at all the latest technologies and amenities and from Wi-Fi to cabin management to OLED to, you know, whatever they can do to make it as comfortable a ride as possible at a very fast speed. That's excellent. And what do we know so far about who may be planning to operate this aircraft? I think I read somewhere that they, they've actually got some sort of provisional commitments for this thing. They do. Actually, they think they have a 40 billion market that they can tap into for the AS2. And already they have a backlog of 3.18 billion. But they say they're in talks with an with potential buyers for another six billion. Mm -hmm. So they're chugging along on the market. Yet FlexJet is their launch customer and their largest customer, but they said that this plane could be targeted at NetJets or VistaJet or even Wheels Up. And when so basically they're largest target market are going to be the large high-end providers of Lyft, whether it's through fractional or charter or membership program. They also think there's a market with high net worth individuals, of course, and corporations. However, I will say that um, Tom Weiss caveated on the corporations that um, he believes many of them are moving away from whole ownership and moving into fractional and other sort of membership models. So I think they might be selling it to corporations yet through those types of models. Right. Understood. And let's just decode that a little bit for those of us who don't follow the nuances of how uh, private flight gets provided, FlexJet and the other companies you mentioned, you know, broadly speaking, they're providing, you know, blocks of charter or shares in parts of aircraft that give people a certain number of hours. Is that right? This is a way of sort of retailing availabilities. And, you know, that's impressive off in and of itself that, you know, that type of company would be considering putting a supersonic jet into their sort of product portfolio. It just means it could be a lot more available than, you know, just a small number of, of super billionaires who could buy a whole thing for themselves. Interesting. Now, back to that environmental point, you know, you talked about the, you know, the engine technology. Of course, you know, th there's growing concern since the days of Concord uh, about aviation's environmental footprint, both in terms of the amount of carbon footprint it has, and indeed noise. And I'm guessing that Arion knows it's got to address those points. It can't just sort of pretend we're back in the 1970s all over again, and nobody could care less about that. No, there's no way they'll have an airplane if they don't address those concerns. And they've said it from the get-go, this will not be the Concorde. We're not looking to make it the Concorde. But they're very... They're being actually kind of savvy about it because they're looking at sustainability through multiple means. So they can come to the market and say, we're making one of the greenest planes we can possibly do. And they're doing it through a couple ways. One, their engine will be stage five, which exceeds current noise and emissions limits. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, the engine will be the first to run on 100% sustainable fuels. And right now that's a di very difficult nut because Typical Jet A fuel has aromatics in it that help protect the seals. And without those aromatics, you can gum things up. So they, they are GE Aviation, which is providing the affinity engine for mm -hmm. the Ariane, has looked at that and think that they can work the technical challenges through so they can get to sustainability. Um, but again, they're, they're also looking beyond the airplane. They're looking at... Um, how their factory is built to make the factory as green as possible. And again, in the future, they want to get off whole fuel or whole traditional fuel engines and move into hybrid and electric. And um, so, you know, they have to have a product that they say, this is not the Concorde. The other thing is that the, there are very strong environmental limitations. Of so course, they yeah. not 
you cannot fly supersonic over fl- over land because it has the sonic boom, which mm-hmm. you know is loud, and um, the vibrations you know have their different effects that aren't great for the environment either. Mm-hmm. But they are right now producing a product with the idea that those restrictions may stay in place, so you can fly it subsonically at very high speeds, much higher than the fastest business jets at the moment, it, but still efficient, still efficiently, like at Mach 9, 8 or so. Mm-hmm. And then get out over the ocean where the restrictions in, mo- in many parts aren't as significant and go supersonic. So they're trying to go for that sweet spot hybrid. And they're also looking at the possibility of doing a trying to convince regulators to look at um, what they call boom cutoff, which is when they have a boom, it doesn't reach all the way to the ground. Instead, it hits a thermal layer and bounces up. If you go at low supersonic speeds, say Mach 1.1, 1.2, the boom may not quite reach the ground. So it doesn't have the impact as it would if you were flying Mach or yeah, Mach 1.4 above. Mm -hmm. So um, it's just a matter of convincing regulators and more importantly, environmentalists, that this concept is a a viable concept for that aircraft. Well, that's very sophisticated work. And the point, you know, what I'm taking from that, even as somebody who struggled with physics at school, is this is a very different creature from Concorde. You know, it's wrong just to assume that this is much the same technology. It's far from that. And by the sound of it, potentially, um, this could be, frankly, more environmentally friendly than, than many current aircraft today. It sounds like quite a leap forward if they can pull all those elements together. Uh, which is fascinating. Now, I, I think we have to clarify that Arion is not the only game in town when it comes to supersonic technology. I mean, just today, for example, I read that uh, the Russian industry is advancing plans for a supersonic airliner. But there are some other players, too. I know that NASA is doing some work in this area. And I've heard about a group called Boom um, developing something called the Baby Boom, I think. What do we know about that? And are any of them, you know, in anywhere close to where Arion are getting? Well, some of them are, they're all in various levels of advanced stage. And yes, it is a growing field and Boom is definitely one of the more advanced players. They're they're developing a um, demonstrator called the XB-1 and uh, they're actually in the production phase where it's starting to come together and they just made it the wing to it and so they're hoping to begin flight of that in 2021 and that of course will be the precursor of their commercial airliner there's another company that's been chugging along called spike which is also Mm -hmm. looking at a higher speed supersonic aircraft and then um, there's one looking at hypersonics uh uh, I think they're called Hypermock. Yes, that's um, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, um, of course, there's the Lockheed Martin NASA collaboration where they're developing an X plane. And this is not a commercial plane, but the idea of this plane is to study sound shapes and the effect of sonic boom and how that'll affect the environment. So they're developing a demonstrator that also may fly next year that will fly over communities and emit a sonic boom, but they call it not a boom, but a thud. Apparently, using different shapes, it will be much quieter than what we know as a traditional sonic boom to see if that's another way we can get to supersonic flight over land. So there's all sorts of different approaches to come to it. But what we do know is Congress has a real appetite, the U.S. Congress, that Mm -hmm. is, has a real appetite for supersonic. Mm -hmm. And they've encouraged the FAA to take a leadership role in fostering these kinds of activities and development. That's fascinating. So it really does sound as if, you know, um, within the next few years, there's a distinct possibility we're going to see a real airplane that's actually capable of delivering this sort of exceptional speed. That's quite a leap forward. I mean, I vividly remember soon after the Concorde was sadly retired, you know, a lot of experts said, that's it. We're never going to see a supersonic civil airplane again. You know, the economics just don't add up. The technology doesn't add up. But, uh, But a lot of that has changed now, and it's great that we're able to follow it.
So, Kerry, thank you very much for keeping a close eye out for us and a, rather a close ear out for the uh, for the, the sonic boom or lack thereof. And uh, please do come back to us when you've got more news on that front. That's excellent. Good to hear. Thank you, Charlie. Will do. Thanks for watching this AIN video. Please like, subscribe, and share it if you've enjoyed it. Also, visit AINonline.com for all the latest on the aviation industry.